I love music. Um, I don't consider myself a musician. Uh, I'm a retired drummer. I'm learning to play the guitar. And, um, yeah, Dono is giving me guitar lessons, and he actually scheduled me and another fellow who's giving lessons to uh, play with the worship team uh, next month. I'm really nervous. <laughs> but I love music, and uh, I love the old rock and roll stories of musicians, and I, I study them. Uh, I love going to old concerts, and it's hard to find many now because most of those guys are dead. Guys of my day. Uh, but let me give you, because most of the people I pastor these days are mature. You come from my generation. And I'm not going to give you the tune because a couple of reasons I won't do that. One, I'll, I'll butcher it. But even in its butchered state, you would recognize the tune. I'll just give you the words. Now, don't shout it out. If you know it, don't shout it out. I'll give you a chance at the, at the end. And just listen to the lyrics and see if you can identify the song. Um, unless you're old, you won't be able to do it. <laughs> Look over yonder. What do you see? The sun is arising, most definitely. A new day is coming. Ooh, ooh. People are changing. Ain't it beautiful? I can't give you the next line because that'd give it away. Better get ready to see the light. Love is the answer. And that's all right. So don't you give up now. So easy to find. Just look to your soul and open your mind. Catch this one. Maybe tomorrow when he looks down, on every green field in every town. All of his children and every nation. There'll be peace and good, brotherhood. Any guesses? People are changing. Ain't it beautiful? Crystal blue persuasion. Now, the band. Come on. Tommy James and the Shondells. Yeah. 1968. It's a classic. Still being played today. Why do I start the message from the Bible with that song? Because just like I shared with John Lennon's song recently, the song Imagine, where John imagined a better world. That's what Tommy James is singing about. I heard Don Henley a few years ago in an interview telling the motivation for most of his songs. He said, these songs are about what is love? What is life? Musicians writing songs, longing for a better world, longing for paradise. Listen, when the Bible says don't love the world or the things in the world, some of us as Christians misunderstand that. You're not to love the creation. No. Appreciate the creation. Enjoy the creation. Don't worship the creation. Worship the creator. And this creation is in a marred state. But as we saw recently, a couple of weeks ago, God is going to restore paradise. Every longing fulfilled, every unfulfilled romantic desire fulfilled in Jesus. He's the fullness of every desire. We have the answer that all the songs are written about. The answer is Jesus. We have a Bible reading plan. i got to say it every time because you never know when we have, might have one new person. 
We have a church Bible reading plan, and what we're doing right now is as we're reading through the Scriptures, and we just finished 1 and 2 Thessalonians, we just started 1 Timothy, we're pulling out a section from our previous reading and teaching on that, and I couldn't help but be led to 1 Thessalonians. I know we've already read it, but go back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, one of my favorite passages. I don't know if you noticed as you read through First and Second Thessalonians that there's a lot of prophecy in these two letters. In First Thessalonians, Paul the Apostle writes, and at the end, Scripture we're going to talk about this morning, he writes about what we call the rapture of the church. He has to write Second Thessalonians because some Somebody, some group, had forged Paul's name and taught the Thessalonian church that the day of the Lord and the rapture of the church had already happened, and they got left behind. And so he writes 2 Thessalonians, and he says, no, nah, the day of the Lord hasn't happened, second coming hasn't taken place, and here's some things that have to happen before that happens. And so you can know that hasn't happened yet. And so you didn't get left behind. First Thessalonians chapter four, one of my favorite passages, verse 13, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. He's talking about death or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's called the rapture of the church. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. How cool is that? The amazing thing is it's really going to happen one day. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. I was so encouraged to have two teenagers come up after last service and come and say to me, I can't believe you taught on the rapture of the church because we've been talking this past week with one another about the rapture of the church. They're doing what the text says. Talk about it. This is not some fairy tale. This is not some Disney animated deal. This is the real thing. This is going to happen one day. And one of the great encouragements about the rapture of the church, it's going to be a reunion. Those we've lost to death in the Lord who are now with the Lord, but their bodies are dead. One day, resurrection bodies... Paul writes and he says, in the twinkling of an eye, be changed. They go first, we go right after them. And in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be changed, we'll meet the Lord in the air. It's amazing to think about. One of the wonderful things about it, and I use this scripture a lot of times at funerals, because it's a great encouragement. You grieve because you've lost someone, but you know they trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, and so you know you're going to see them again. You're going to be reunited. I often think of my mother. I still miss her. But I know where she is. I think of my grandmother, and I miss her. But I know where she is. I can't wait to see my Uncle Marine my Aunt Patricia, my Uncle James, my Aunt Lib. I thought in this message of the reunion that I'm going to have with Bro Laird. 
Pastor Vivian Laird that served with me at the other church for many years, Irish fellow with the white hair, prayer warrior. But if you knew Pastor Viv, if you got to know him, know him at all, if every time he saw you, he would say, hey, bro, how you doing? If he always called you bro, you knew he couldn't remember your name. <laughs> and in his elderly years, he, he couldn't remember your name. He called me bro a lot of times. I can't wait to see Pastor Viv again. I can't wait to see Marilyn Laird again. Can't you just hear Viv? Bro! Good to see you. But even greater than the reunion we'll have with loved ones that we've lost to death in this life is being with the Lord. Now, you have to take that by faith. But you take it by faith from the Scriptures. I wrote down Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Here's what it says. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. It's going to be so glorious when we're caught up and we're with the Lord, instantaneously changed, resurrection bodies, and every disappointment in this life will be made right. Every unfulfilled longing fulfilled. Every romantic desire fulfilled. Listen, he's the fullness of life, Jesus. And we're going to have fullness completely in him. I like to tell people, look, if you're not married, when the rapture takes place and you want to get married, you'll never ask to come back and do it over again so you can get married. There'll be complete fulfillment and an amazing reunion. It's going to happen. I can't wait. But I have to. But I do have a question. How close are we to the rapture of the church? How close are we? Some of you have heard these things before. It's okay. need to hear them again. Here's some things that remind me how close we are. In the 1940s, a prophecy from Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled. Israel became a nation again. For hundreds of years, please understand, there was no nation of Israel. And a lot of the prophecies of the second coming of Christ that had to be fulfilled have to do with the nation of Israel. Well, for hundreds of years, there was no nation, Israel. So during those years, you would have read these prophecies connected with Israel, and you would have gone, can't be soon. There is no Israel. But in the 1940s, Israel was reborn as a nation, miraculously. Ezekiel the prophet looks there, recorded for us in Ezekiel 37. It's a valley filled with dry bones. And the question is asked, can these bones live? This is a smart prophet. He says to God, you know. I don't know. And all of a sudden, the bones begin to shake and rattle. And then they stand upright. They become skeletons. And then flesh comes on the bones. It's a vision of the prophecy of the rebirth of the nation of Israel. We live in what's called the church age. Now, why is this important? Don't have time to get into these things in detail, but Daniel chapter 9 Verses 25 to 27 is a specific prophecy God gave to Daniel concerning things that would take place before the end of the world as we know it and the coming, second coming of the Messiah. It's 490 years of human history. 483 of those 490 years have already been fulfilled. 483rd year, the prophecy fulfilled was that the anointed one, that's Messiah, that's what Messiah means, the anointed one, 
Messiah would be cut off. That's the cross. Prophecies leading up to the coming of the Messiah and the cross now fulfilled. Jesus dies on the cross. 483 years fulfilled. And then something the Old Testament prophets did not know because God didn't tell them. It was this thing called the church age. And the church age began at the cross. 483 years completed of 490 years of prophecy and things happening on the earth before the Messiah comes back. There's a gap between the 483rd year and the 490th year. The 490th year is when Messiah returns. It's called the church age. Because Israel has rejected their Messiah as a nation, as a whole, and now the gospel has gone out to a world of Gentiles. Any pure Jewish blood here this morning, you're a Jew? None in this service. We had three in the last service. That's rare. So in this service right now, we're a bunch of mutts. We're a bunch of Gentiles. And I'm so thankful that the gospel has gone out to the Gentile world. And what has to happen, one of the things that the Bible prophesies before the second coming of Christ is that the Gentiles, that God is willed to be saved, are going to be saved. And when the last Gentile is saved, then Jesus breaks through the clouds. So, again, the prophecy here, 483 years of prophecy already fulfilled, and now this undisclosed period of time called the church age. The end of the church age is the beginning of what the Bible calls the great tribulation. Jesus said it's going to be a time on the earth unequaled from the beginning and never to be equaled again. And things in quick succession begin to happen on the earth, and it's going to be cataclysmic. So 483 years, the cross Undisclosed period of time, the church age. At the end of the church age, the beginning of this seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. At the end of that seven-year period, 490 years, Jesus returns. Point is, we're living in the church age. We live in the days of modern military. We live in the days of nuclear capability. We've seen it years ago. Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Revelation chapter 6 and 9, hard to fathom, prophesies that in this period known as the Great Tribulation, 50% of the world perishes because of world war and then the judgments begin to fall from heaven, and people begin to die not only from the world war, but from the judgments that fall from heaven. Jesus said if those days had not been cut short, nobody would survive. And as hard as it is to fathom, 50% of the population dies. You would have read that years ago and gone, how in the world are that many people going to die from a world war in that short period of time. Well, we know. Modern military ability, nuclear. During the Great Tribulation, God raises up two special witnesses. They have prophecies, or they have ministries similar to Moses and Elijah. They can turn water into blood. Uh, they can call down fire from heaven against their enemies. Pretty good tool. They minister for three and a half years, half of the great tribulation. And then God says, okay, your ministry's done. Allows the world to martyr them. They die in Jerusalem where they're prophesying. And here's what the Bible says very specifically. The world is so happy that these guys are dead. It's what I call the first anti-Christmas. They begin to send gifts to one another because these guys are dead. They refuse them burial for three and a half days. They only bury them because by now they're, 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 they're going to bury them. They don't ever get to. Their, their bodies are starting to decay. And just as they're probably about to bury them, God says, okay, 
and he snatches them up to heaven. But here's what's fascinating. The prophecy says that the world, the world will gaze on their dead bodies. You would have read that years ago and gone, how in the world is the world going to see those dead bodies? Well, it's nothing for our generation. Every major network is going to be there. It's going to be broadcast on every channel around the world. And everybody's going to celebrate the first anti-Christmas. You would have read many, many, many years about this thing called the mark of the beast that you can't buy or sell. You go into Publix unless you got the mark on your hand or on your forehead, no checkout. Interesting to me how many places I go during COVID-19 that you can't use cash. They're already doing the chip thing. They're doing the chip thing on humans. They're experimenting now with what looks like a tattoo. It is a tattoo, but it's like your barcode. And now, just like you would scan the barcode of something you're purchasing, now, in order to pay for what you're purchasing, it might not be a chip. It could be a barcode right there on your hand, right there on your forehead. We look at it and go, I know how that would happen. They're already doing it. This is one of the most fascinating to me and the one that gets my Jesus bumps going. Prophecy in Ezekiel 38 verse 5 of a group of nations, and they are named there, and they ally themselves together against Israel. You look at every one of those nations, and every one of those nations, as we sit here in church this morning, they hate Israel. If they had their way, they'd wipe Israel off the map. And Ezekiel prophesies that these nations are one day going to come together against Israel during what's known as the Great Tribulation. For hundreds and hundreds of years since the prophecy has been given, two of the nations that are listed in verse 5, have never had a military alliance until just a few short years ago. And now Russia and ancient Persia, which is modern-day Iran, have a military alliance. And they are in league with other nations, friends with other nations listed there in Ezekiel 38, verse 5, that hate. Israel. And then you have Luke 21. I hate the COVID thing. I love the COVID thing. I hate the COVID thing. I love the COVID thing. What do you mean? Every time I think of COVID-19, I think of Luke 21, verse 11. Luke 21, verse 11. In a list of things that Jesus said, here are some things that are signs of my soon coming. And when you see all these things, Luke 21, verse 11. There'll be great earthquakes. Man, it's nothing to see another earthquake in a place you never heard of an earthquake. Famines, and here it is, pestilences. It's a pandemic. It's not the first pandemic the world has experienced. One of the worst years ago was called the bubonic or black plague. But here's the difference in COVID-19 and the black plague and others like it. This one's global. It's affecting the whole world. You talk about a message from God for the world. You talk about a sign of Jesus' soon coming. COVID-19 is a very clear one. If you got your spiritual ears on and your spiritual eyes open. 
Listen, I put in my notes. I know of nothing prophetically that needs to happen before the rapture of the church. And the rapture of the church marks the beginning of the Great Tribulation, and the end of the Great Tribulation, which is only seven years, is the second coming of Jesus. I don't know if the name Don Stewart means anything to you, but he goes way back in the early days of what's called the Calvary Chapel movement. Don Stewart still today is a great apologist. It means he's defend defender of the faith. He's also a, a prophecy nut, and he knows a lot about prophecy. He did a message a few years ago at one of the Calvary Chapel conferences I was attending, and it's one of those messages that I actually remember. We all forget most messages we hear. But I remember Don's. He taught from Matthew chapter 13 and just two verses, verses 16 and 17. And it's Jesus' words. And here I read verse 16 of Matthew 13. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men Long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And Don talked about some of the things that I've talked about for the first few minutes of this message, about prophecy being fulfilled. But he did it in light of Jesus' words to those disciples. And Jesus was saying those, to those disciples, what a privilege you have to be living in the days of the coming of the Messiah, the first coming, and to be called as his disciples and to say yes and to become a follower of the Messiah. And yet as blessed as those disciples were, what Don Stewart was used by God to show me more than ever before is how much more blessed my eyes are. And my ears are. And he called his message, and it was so appropriate. Blessed are our eyes. Do you realize the day we're living in? Do you realize how close we are to the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ? I can tell we're so close, you're just jumping up and down with the excitement. Inside. Okay, I have a question for you. In light of what we covered so far, how close are we, really? Harold Camping, I wasn't really looking for an actual response, you know. <laughs> when a pastor asks that, he's not really looking for a real response. Harold Camping, he was an American Christian radio broadcaster, author, and evangelist. A few short years ago, he made predictions for the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus Christ. His first was September the 6th, 1994. Well, that date didn't work out, so he revised it to September the 29th. Didn't happen then either. He then made it October the 2nd. Later, he said it would be May the 21st, 2011. <clears throat> Wish he was right, because that's my birthday. He was so sure of this date that his radio ministry pumped tons of money and resources toward a huge publicity campaign. It pop prompted tremendous ridicule from atheist organizations as well as rebuttals from Christian organizations. May 21st came and went, and Camping said he believed a spiritual judgment occurred on May 21st and that the rapture would now occur on October the 21st, 2011. That date passed, nothing happened, and the mainstream media then labeled Camping a false prophet. Here's the good news to that story. Before his death, Camping admitted in a private interview that he no longer believed anybody could know the time of the rapture 
or the end of the world. In March 2012, he stated that his attempt to predict a date was sinful and that his critics had been right in emphasizing Matthew 24, 36, where Jesus said, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Back to our text, 1 Thessalonians. Harold Camping should have read 1 Thessalonians now, chapter 5, verse 1. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we don't need to write to you. For you know very well, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And they will not escape. You back that up with the full words that Jesus said recorded in Matthew 24, verse 36. But let me read you the whole section. No one knows about that day or hour. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark. And catch this. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Pause on that. They knew nothing. It's not because somebody wasn't warning them, somebody wasn't telling them. For 120 years, Noah was warning the world, judgment is coming. And he was inviting them. All you got to do is get in the boat, get in the ark. The ark is Christ. For 120 years, the world had an opportunity. That's how it'll be at the coming of the Son of Man. Catch verse 40. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. That sounds like the rapture. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. That's a rapture. Verse 42, therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, it's very personal to me. Why? Let me read it and tell you. He would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. That verse is so interesting to me because some days I'm going, Maybe it's today. And then I realize, if I think it's today, it's not today. Years ago, it was on a Wednesday night. My wife and I were driving separately to the church service. I left. She left after me. Both, both of us talked later and noticed four men, young men, walking down our street. We didn't recognize them. Long story made short, they were going down the street, through the neighborhood, breaking into houses, and they were stealing especially computers. We got home, found the back window of the door knocked out. They broke in our house. Didn't take a lot, but took my laptop, took my son's $50. I wish I'd have known they were coming. If I had known... I'd have still gone to the church service, but I would have had somebody stay at the house. I would have talked to one of my policeman buddies and said, hey, could you come hang out at my house while I'm at church tonight? I think somebody's going to rob us. You say, well, how could you know that? Well, I didn't. And so our house got broken into. The point of Jesus' words is this. You don't know. It's going to be a surprise to everybody.
Here's the way I put it into my notes. We will not have time to get ready. We must be ready. That is the great challenge of the Christian life, isn't it? I don't know who coined it, but they said the great challenge of the Christian life is that it is so daily. I don't want him to come on a day I'm not ready. I want to be ready. But he tells me he's coming when I don't expect him. So I'm not going to be ready. You've got to always be ready. Oh, that's a tall challenge, isn't it? But he tells us how. He does? Yeah. Let's close it out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He tells us how to be ready. Verse 4. But you brothers are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You'll be surprised, but you shouldn't be caught by surprise. You're all sons of the light and sons of the day. We don't belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. But let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled. That's the second time he says that. Putting on faith and love as a breastplate. The hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, the great tribulation, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, rapture. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up, just as, in fact, you're doing. Again, the teenagers talking this past week about the rapture of the church. You know what they're doing? They're encouraging one another. They're building one another up. There are three things he says. We close with these. Don't be like others. Spiritually asleep, spiritually drunk. The condition just suggests that they're, they're not sensitive, they're not ready, and so they can't respond properly because they're not ready. Don't be like others. Be alert. We just read in Matthew 24, keep watch, keep watch. It's a, it's a perfect present imperative. I think that's the way they say it in the Greek. In other words, it's, it's to be 24-7. Now, I found a verse that I think helps us on this one. And here's the verse. Now, I want you to be alert, and to show that you're alert, say this with me. You ready? Here we go. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That was good enough to read, read one more time. You ready? So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. And so I think about that. When I'm fishing, you study the Gospels, there's one thing you know about Jesus. He's a fisherman. He knows where the fish are. I want Jesus in my boat. I also want him because I've been in storms out in the Gulf of Mexico, and you want Jesus in the boat when you're in a storm. Guys that are my main fishing buddies, we've been fishing together for years. And we know each other well enough that, that we needle one another. You're on my boat, you, know, you don't get needled, it means we don't like you. We make fun of one another. You know, a guy catches the big grouper of the day, and we, we, we hear that story for years. But then you hear the good stories, too. You hear that, oh, man. And, and here's the kind of things you'll hear on my boat when the big grouper and the rod bends, and you're like, oh, hallelujah. That's the kind of things we say. You hear some guys on a bad day, not on my boat, but, but I've heard it when I've been on other people's boats. Non-Christians. Jesus Christ. Like, what? What an awful thing to say. What a blasphemous thing to say. Well, it's because they don't have God in their lives. They don't know Jesus. When you know Jesus, look, you take him with you fishing. I've not been the perfect 
husband and father. But I've come a long way. <laughs> and even when I'm in my imperfection, my kids will tell you, every time we went on vacation, we took God with us. My kids will tell you, we got up in the morning and I gathered them together and we read scripture together. And we pray and we thank the Lord for the opportunity to be on vacation. We thank the Lord for the money He provided for us to be able to go on vacation. My kids will tell you that. We took God with us on vacation. I think about this verse and I have a video in my mind. It keeps replaying. I'm in Hartsfield, South Carolina, my hometown. They built the first Hardee's. That was a big deal. We didn't have restaurants. You want to go to Hardee's, you got to drive 24 miles to Florence. Now we got a Hardee's. And so I'm in Hardee's. I'm not living for the Lord. But I look over. Elderly black man. Remember it? It's a video in my mind. He's by himself. He sits down with his tray and his cheeseburger and his fries and his Coke. And before he begins to indulge, he bows his head. He folds his hand. I'll never forget it. Don't ever eat a meal without thanking God for the meal. Take God with you everywhere you go, in everything you do. That's how you keep watch. Then there's nothing you want to be doing that's not glorifying to God so that when He comes, rapture the church takes place and it's going to happen when you don't expect it. Try to make yourself go, I don't expect him to come today. I don't expect him to come today. <laughs> Be alert. And then he says twice. Be self-controlled. My goodness, I could spend a lot of time on this one. Because there's scriptures everywhere. You go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse um, 4. Each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that's holy and honorable. Self-control. Titus, Paul writes and he says, As we look for the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we ought to live upright, self-controlled, godly lives. Second Peter, Peter writes and he says, Add to your faith self-control. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I beat my body, I make it my slave, so that after I preach to others, I myself would not become a castaway. Then he goes beyond just the body, physical self-control. He says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we're to take captive every thought. Boy, this is a daily challenge, isn't it? And he writes such practical things in places like Philippians 4, verse 8. And he lists all these godly things. And he says, think about these things, things that are pure and holy and right. Garbage in, garbage out. I thought of Pastor Viv Laird. He told me about a couple of times that Christians had recommended these movies to him. And he goes to see the movie. And he comes back to me and he says, bro, bro. He was surprised that a Christian would recommend the movie. And he says, bro, why would I go to something like that? And here's what he would say, soil my soul. Made me think of the verse that our whole body, mind, soul, and spirit be kept blameless until the day of Christ. Take captive every thought. Don't let the garbage in because it's garbage in, garbage out. I don't have the time, but in the last part of Matthew 24, after he says to believers, keep watch. You know how he ends it? He says, some will say, my master's a long time in coming, and they'll begin to live for self and live like the world. And he says the master's going to come on a day they don't expect him. 
And he says about those who are unprepared, he's going to assign them a place with the hypocrites where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ooh, that sounds like hell. That sounds like they weren't truly saved. Being unprepared could be a sign that you're not really saved. I beg you, I beg you as I close this service, I beg you, if you don't have the assurance that you've been born again by faith in Jesus Christ, you settle that today. Well, let's end it for believers. Say this, and really, I'm done. If you'll say this with me, you ready? And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed at it. He's coming. Don't answer out loud. Don't, don't even make a noise, but just, are you ready? Some Christians aren't ready. Something in your life, some habit, something displeasing to the Lord, that if the rapture were to take place today, you're not ready. But you can be. If you're willing to repent, if you're willing to confess and turn from whatever it is that's displeasing to the Lord, would you do that? You're here with us. You're watching by live stream. Make a decision today that you'll be glad you did when you stand before Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. How blessed, Lord, to live in a generation that's seen so many prophecies fulfilled. And I don't know of any prophecy that needs to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church takes place. I pray for Christians who are not ready. I pray, Lord, you'd grant them repentance, you'd grant them a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. As we're still bowed in prayer, you're here, you're watching my live stream. If you don't have the assurance that you have been born again by faith in Jesus Christ, what you'd like to be, would you just say from your heart to Him? You just pray this from your heart. God's listening. God hears you. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now help me to live for you the rest of this life. So Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you for your Holy Spirit and I thank you for those who have received you as Lord and Savior, and I thank you for Christians who have made a fresh commitment. And finally, Lord, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We look forward to your soon coming. We thank you for the hope that we have. Go before us now in Jesus' name.